Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Advances in Autism Research and Care webinar. We're thrilled to have you. Um, a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. Um, first, the webinar is being recorded um, and the recording will be sent out following the presentation and will also be available on our network YouTube channel for anyone who couldn't make it today. Second, we'll leave um, five or 10 minutes at the end for a Q&A session with our presenter. Um, you can submit any questions on the toolbar on the right hand side of your screen and I will read them out to our presenter at the end. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Donna Murray, Vice President of Clinical Programs at Autism Speaks to introduce our presenter today. Donna, give me one second, just have to unmute you. All right, you should be able to. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Lucy. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Fry. Uh, Dr. Fry is the Chief of the Division of Neurodevelopmental Disorders and the Director of the Autism Program at Phoenix Children's Hospital and Professor of Child Health at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix, Arizona. Dr. Fry is a well-recognized expert in the diagnosis and treatment of ASD and other developmental disorders. He has a broad background, including specific training in neurodevelopmental disorders, physiology, psychology, and biostatistics. And interestingly, uh, he has fellowship trained in behavioral neurology and psychology um, and has clinical expertise in the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of children with ASD. He has developed several medically-based autism clinics specifically designed to diagnose and treat neurological and metabolic abnormalities associated with ASD. So we're really pleased to have Dr. Fry and the Phoenix Children's um, Hospital as a member of the Autism Learning Health Network. So welcome, Dr. Fry. We're really uh, excited to hear your talk today. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the introduction and the, um, the opportunity to speak and, of course, being included in the network. We're really excited to be a part of the network um, and, um, and really excited about everything that, uh, that you guys are doing. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll definitely welcome questions and feedback and everything afterwards. Um, so um, let's see, um, there we go. Uh, just some disclosures, um, I have research funding from organizations, national organizations, foundations, federal grants and such, industry support, I'm on several advisory boards. Um, disclaimer, you know, um, I like to always put a disclaimer because I do talk about treatments um, um, that are in development for kids with autism. And, you know, it's important to make the point that none of these treatments are really FDA approved. Um, and I think it's, and, you know, of course, it's always important to, to have people realize that any treatment that they use really needs to be done on it with an expert um, for that treatment, you know, um, kids with autism are very sensitive, so any of this stuff should not be taken lightly. Um, but also, I think it also makes the point that um, we have a long way to go to get FDA-approved treatments, and, and and that should be our goal for any treatment that um, that has the uh, the possibility of helping children with autism. And um, really, there's a lack of treatment, so it's something that that we're trying to do, and I think it's a, a really a giant unmet need. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about um, is um, is the program that um, I kind of took over when I came to uh, uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital uh, called the Early Access for Care Arizona. And uh, this is, I think, an important program. And, um, and I know other programs like this are going on around the country. And it's just so important because, as you know, you know, the latest uh, CDC report you know, suggests that we haven't made really a, a dent um, in how early we diagnose um, children with autism, um, despite, you know, it's been 20 years since really that that we've raised the, the flag to say this is such an important uh, disorder. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we know, and I know this is going around all around the country, is that, uh, that there's this giant lag time in order to uh, get uh, children diagnosed. Um, and uh, specialty centers are really swamped um, to, uh, to evaluate children um, and get them um, uh, services. So um, our goal is really to train PCPs um, to provide the diagnosis um, at the front lines 
Um, with the fidelity, and that's what's really important, is with the fidelity that will allow them to get services through the Department of Developmental Disabilities here in Arizona. Uh, the uh, DDD in Arizona has certain criteria of who they uh, believe is can diagnose autism, and, and many of them are specialty trained, that is, uh, neurologists, developmental medicine, psychologists, psychiatry, um, and such. But it doesn't recognize PCPs unless they have special training. So we've developed a program to give them some special uh, training so that they um, uh, they can make the diagnosis at the front lines. Um, this really started back in 2015 before I came to PCH. Um, and um, it, uh, in the, the first year, was um, one of the uh, more successful years. Uh, 19 uh, doctors uh, started and nine completed. Um, and then um, there was a less successful rate um, throughout the years. We, when I came to PCH, uh, we actually uh, polled, we did a survey of um, uh, doctors to see if uh, they'd be still interested. And there was a, a gigantic interest. So we restarted the program. And last year we um, uh, trained 10 physicians and seven non-physicians. You know, unfortunately, you can't get a certification if you're not a non-physician, but we still think those, that anybody, it's really important for them to understand um, the uh, process and the importance of the tools that we need uh, to diagnose autism. Uh, we had a good, pretty good attendance uh, for our webinar series, um, and, um, and the certification process is ongoing now, and we're really pleased that starting in uh, this month, that so far we have 32 uh, doctors registered for the upcoming um, training uh, session. Um, for, uh, you know, I don't have time to talk about in, in a lot of detail, but suffice it to say, what we try and do is uh, set up a, um, um, a, a kind of a flow chart algorithm, if you will, for uh, doctors to make it um, somewhat um, simple enough uh, to understand the diagnostic a process and um, and um, our philosophy, of course, is to start with developmental screening. Make sure that uh, every child that comes to a PCP's office gets developmental screening. Uh, those that um, that um, may be um, uh, read uh, have have failed screen or have concerns. Get a level one screener for autism. Um, if they fail that, go on to a level two screener. Um, and um, there's special training for both the RITA and the STAT in our program as level two screeners. Um, and then if they fail that, um, go um, to get an ADOS evaluation. Um, and uh, and with, um, with the changes in um, the, uh, the ability to use the ADOS with PPE right now, we're reevaluating that. That's an, an important component, but um, um, as you know, um, it's not really thought that the ADOS is valid with PPE on, so it does uh, raise a, an issue that we're dealing with right now. Um, if uh, the diagnosis is confirmed with the ADOS or other gold standard, um, we uh, train the evaluators how to rate functional limitations. We actually recommend using a, a standardized tool like the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale to actually um, document functional limitations and then develop a diagnostic report that is recognized by the Department of Developmental Disabilities so that um, the child will um, pretty much be guaranteed to, um, uh, to get services. Um, we also have a, another um, thing in, in Arizona, that is that uh, children under six, they don't formally need the diagnosis of autism to get services. They can actually be referred uh, uh, in the category of at risk. Um, but um, so we're putting that also in the algorithm to try and get children into services earlier, but not stopping the, um, the diagnostic algorithm so that they will have the diagnosis uh, when they need it after uh, six years of age. Um, it's, a, it's a program where you have to you know, meet certain goals, their certification of knowledge, uh, we have an annual meeting uh, that includes uh, speakers um, to talk not only about a diagnostic process, but um, the uh, wider uh, comorbidities, differential diagnosis, and treatment of um, autism. 
Um, um, the, um, the program is um, set up so that it's regular webinars, um, which um, must be attended or viewed online. And uh, there's literature that needs to be read and um, then test questions for each of the um, webinar um, 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 webinars to make sure that the knowledge is obtained. Um, and then we um, obtain certification and tools on the RITA and the STAT. Uh, the ADOS is optional. You know, um, some we think that um, the a lot of the pediatricians don't have the time to actually even do an ADOS. So we uh, we're trying to create a network of ADOS uh, uh, providers or ADIR providers that they can use um, or refer to when that's necessary in the diagnostic process. Um, here's just a list of some of the webinars that we have. Um, and uh, we've actually expanded it this year. We've added um, webinars on the emotional impact on the family of the diagnosis of autism and then also billing so that it, it can be very practical, you know, that PCPs can practically do this and get reimbursed uh, for it. We've actually expanded it um, this year so that we have mentors um, to all the participants um, and then also case discussions and we require the participants to actually bring in at least one case during the uh, training uh, to discuss and present. Um, and then uh, in order to get certification, they need to actually um, um, complete uh, five evaluations that include all of the necessary components um, that would give the child a gold standard diagnosis and be recognized by the uh, Department of Developmental Disabilities. And they get a certification. So next time they evaluate a child and they submit um, their diagnosis to the DDD, they actually have the certification that they can um, add on to the uh, diagnostic paperwork and they'll be recognized. And this, we feel, will help kids really get uh, services faster um, in Arizona. As far as our clinic, you know, um, since um, um, I started doing um, autism since I started seeing kids with autism um, um, over uh, 10 years ago. Um, really, we've kind of taken a, um, a, a multidisciplinary approach. And, and that is, um, in addition to the gold standard treatment of behavioral and educational therapy, um, we believe that it's really important to evaluate children for other comorbid conditions and other factors that will make really symptoms um, worse. And, and that includes environmental factors, you know, in, in, including things like allergens and, and diet, but also, of course, things uh, that will uh, worsen sensory sensitivities. Of course, their environmental, um, I'm sorry, their educational factors, the quality of education, the therapies that they're getting, the setting that they're in, and the psychosocial uh, factors. You know, um, we know that uh, that uh, there seems to be a high um, rate of neurologic disorders, sleep disturbance, and such with uh, uh, with with autism, which is very important to evaluate and treat. GI disorders are very prominent and really can cause a lot of distress and comorbidity. So we evaluate children for that. And then there's these systemic conditions um, that we find um, with uh, redox metabolism mitochondrial function, folate metabolism, um, as well as genetic disorders that really need to be evaluated, we feel, to, to get a whole picture of the child and, and make sure that they're, um, they're treated optimally. Um, the systematic approach I started when I was back at the University of Texas, Houston, back in 2010. Um, and one of the things that uh, yeah, I'm really uh, pleased about um, to be in the uh, the Autism um, Learning Health Network is the approach, you know, that uh, and the philosophy about following um, symptoms and, um, and for really health outcomes um, as we treat these children. And, and through the years, um, we've tried several different ways. When I was at University of Texas, we developed something called the PRAS, the Parent Rated Autism Symptomatic Change Scale which um, uh, we uh, used systematically on every appointment when a child came in to look at change in symptoms. And we were actually able to document the effect of leucovorin, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit, 
um, and we've been very successful at, at developing that. And that started that started really as observations, systematic observations in the clinic. Um, when I went to Arkansas Children's Hospital, we developed a comprehensive medical intake questionnaire. Um, and then at every visit, we followed um, children using the ABC and the SRS and the child um, uh, uh, sleep habits questionnaire. And uh, now at Phoenix uh, Children's Hospital, um, at intake, we um, have this comprehensive medical questionnaire, also ABC, SRS, sleep, sensory, we look at GI symptoms, and then of course, um, the uh, great questionnaires that have been developed by the um, um, Autism um, Learning Health Network. Um, and then every visit, um, we monitor symptoms um, to make sure that we're going in the right direction, or if there's um, some type of issue that we can address it really um, in the clinic. And you know, this is kind of the optimal um, diagram of a, of a multi-specialty clinic that we're trying to develop. Um, we're not definitely not there yet, but the idea to have core specialists that uh, see the child, evaluate the child at least initially for these important um, uh, uh, medical comorbidities and come up with a comprehensive plan uh, to um, uh, to treat uh, the child. When I was at Arkansas, we had a, um, um, a multi-specialty clinic that included uh, neurology, uh, genetics, GI, and nutrition, which worked uh, quite well. Um, and um, and I think it was important that uh, that children get this comprehensive um, evaluation. So at at Phoenix, this is something that we're working towards right now. Um, as far as the research, I'll go into and tell you a little bit about the research that uh, we're doing. We're very much um, interested in um, many conditions that are treatable and treatable um, easily with um, with treatments that have um, uh, low incidence of um, adverse effects. Um, my particular interest is in metabolic disorders because they tend to be treatable and they're uh, treatable with uh, uh, with treatments um, that uh, that are commonly known to be safe. Um, uh, so uh, so it's it's been um, my interest, and I'll talk a little bit about these. The first one is really uh, something that we've had a lot of success with, and that's looking at fully metabolism abnormalities and, and how to treat them in children with autism. Um, folate, um, as you probably know, is a very important vitamin. You know, we fortify our food with folic acid because it's so, uh, because folates are so important. Of course, one of the, the issues with folic acid is that it's a synthetic oxidized form of folate that our body needs to reduce in order to get it into the folate cycle. And um, some people um, have um, issues with reducing it. That is, there's um, polymorphisms in uh, dihydrofolate reductase that's associated with autism, at least in one study, uh, that suggests that uh, they may have problems reducing it to the active form of folate. Um, so in order to get um, folate into the folate cycle without the oxidized form, we need a reduced form and the form that uh, we are researching and we look at is called folinic acid or um, leucovorin, known by its drug name, um, which uh, we feel is really uh, um, a very um, uh, important uh, uh, drug. And it um, has been one of the great things is that uh, leucovorin has been used for decades in oncology uh, to rescue the body of, from the side effects of methotrexate. So its use and safety, especially at much higher doses than we use in children with autism, is, is really known. So that really gives us a nice um, basis uh, for knowing about um, medication. Um, folate is so important. Um, it <clears throat> um, it um, is important for many um, essential um, pathways in our uh, body methylation metabolism we know um, is uh, dysregulated in, in autism redox metabolism uh, but also um, the production of purines which are precursors to of course DNA RNA but also ATP 
uh, that's adenosine to, to be produced into ATP by the mitochondria, and BH4, which of course is important for production of neurotransmitters and known to be um, reduced, especially early on in children um, with autism. Um, and this is just another diagram to, to show you that the folate cycle is kind of in the middle of all these metabolic pathways. Um, um, so um, it is uh, quite important. So how did we get uh, started with this? So uh, what's, uh, what um, is interesting is that in about 2005, um, uh, Dr. Rainmakers uh, from Belgium um, described this new disorder called cerebral folate deficiency um, in a paper in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, he had described um, children with folate deficiency, cerebral folate deficiency uh, several years before. He actually found that there were these kiddos that had neurodevelopmental regression, um, usually before a year of age. And um, uh, what seemed to be happening is that uh, when he measured their folate levels and their cerebral spinal fluid, it was very low um, and um, it was normal in the blood. So um, he reasoned that there was a problem transporting folate um, into the brain. Um, he looked for genetic disorders and couldn't find any genetic disorders in the folate transporter. And then Dr. Edward Quatros from SUNY Downstate uh, collaborated with him and found out that there were these autoantibodies um, which uh, we can see here, that bound on to the folate receptor alpha. And you can see on the bottom, um, folate um, is, uh, is taken in by the folate receptor alpha. It crosses the blood-brain barrier um, using the folate receptor alpha. But they, what Dr. Quattro's found is that there's the, some people have these two, one of two antibodies, either something called the blocking antibody which binds onto the folate receptor alpha and doesn't let folate uh, bind to it, or the blocking antibody, which uh, blocks onto, which binds onto the folate receptor and blocks its ability to function. Um, the good thing is that our body has a backup system, something called the reduced folate carrier, which you can see in the kind of bottom middle there. Um, and you can see the reduced folate carrier is smaller than the folate receptor alpha. And the um, uh, what uh, and it's like that because it doesn't have the same affinity for folate, and it doesn't like folate as much as the folate receptor alpha, and you need a reduced folate. So in order to coax it through the reduced folate carrier, you really have to give high doses of reduced folate, which is leucovorin, and you can um, um, potentially fix this um, this issue. So um, as this um, this was described. Um, um, we, um, uh, um, and I'll just say this, I'm sorry, this, this slide, which is very interesting, is that also these uh, same transport mechanisms that transport folate into the brain um, are also on the placenta. So this suggests that if mom has one of these antibodies, that folate may not be getting into the, uh, the baby, the fetus. Um, as it should, um, and uh, that may be the reason why um, extra folate, higher doses of folate protects against um, um, autism and pregnancies in, in some cases. Um, so um, at any rate, um, uh, reading this literature, um, we've, uh, we uh, found that, uh, that as more and more case studies were being described of kids with cerebral folate deficiency, um, there were more uh, case studies and case uh, series that suggested that the children may have autism, that some of the children with cerebral folate deficiency um, uh, may have autism. So uh, myself and my colleague, Dr. Rosignol, um, um, offered this test for the antibody um, to our patients uh, that were in the uh, clinic um, and to, to see if maybe some of the children's we were, children we were seeing in the clinic may have this um, antibody in their blood. And we found out uh, something that seemed pretty astonishing, that 60% um, of the children coming through our clinic had the blocking autoantibody, and 50% um, had the binding um, autoantibody. Um, so there, um, there was, and if you look at um, um, how many children had one or the other antibody, it was about 75%. 
um, of the children, which was um, uh, quite astonishing um, when we saw the data. So um, what we reasoned was that um, we knew the treatment was leucovorin or folinic acid, and um, um, it seemed that in other studies that you uh, that children with the folate autoantibody and cerebral folate deficiency responded to leucovorin. So um, individuals that um, had um, the antibody, um, we offered either a lumbar puncture to see what the folate level was um, in their CSF, or we thought that it was um, reasonable um, since um, leucovorin is uh, safe that, uh, that we could um, try them on leucovorin um, at the doses that have been used um, in the published studies um, to um, see if they would respond to um, uh, leucovorin. Um, and, um, and then when they came back, as I mentioned, we were using this, um, uh, this um, instrument to look at change, either improvement and worsening in uh, several different um, symptoms. And here we have nine of the, the uh, symptoms that we were looking at um, um, every time the child came in. Uh, so we had some data as far as uh, whether the children that we treated um, were getting better or worse. And then what we did is that we also had patients, of course, that we had um, measured the antibody on uh, and hadn't made any changes in the time that they had seen us in follow-up and hadn't been treated um, at all. And so you could call this a kind of a waitlist control group. And they also, um, you know, since um, part of our protocol, our clinical protocol, was for them to fill out this uh, uh, questionnaire. Um, we also measured whether their symptoms got better or worse in that time period without making any changes. Of course, this is all open label. Um, nobody is blind to anything. So, and what we were able to do is really compare the change in what would be kind of a, a, um, a, a, a standard treatment group without any uh, changes and um, one that uh, par and patients that got uh, leucovorin. And what we found out is that leucovorin um, seemed to, uh, to make a, a particular, um, and the children on leucovorin made a particular improvement in language, that is in receptive language, expressive language, and verbal communication. Although stereotype behavior and attention did improve also, really the thing that seemed to be most obvious was language. Um, and then this is just a, um, another way of displaying the data showing the children that improved, changed, or worsened. And we can see that uh, for the most part, um, there was very high rate of children improving um, with, um, in, first in language um, and very few um, um, worsened. So that led us to, the, of course, the next stage in, um, in developing any therapeutic is a double-blind placebo-control uh, study. And um, since we did the first study and found out that language or verbal communication was the thing that changed, we really had our primary outcome measure. And the great thing about verbal communication or language, um, which I think that, uh, that led to success in our study, is that it's one thing that you can actually get an objective measure on. You know, that is that many studies um, uh, for kids in autism use questionnaires that are filled out by parents or other observers um, that uh, could be biased because of um, one uh, because of different uh, factors, and, and we know that from um, from other studies that there seems to be this uh, this uh, placebo effect um, in uh, many trials that can be uh, very high. But what we were able to do is actually use a um, objective exam examiner um, to use a, a standardized um, uh, language test. We used the self um, or the uh, the preschool um, language scales, PLS, um, depending on their ability. And uh, we randomized 48 patients um, and um, um, so uh, 25 <coughs> allocated to placebo, 23 to high dose folinic acid or leucovorin. And what we found was that those that were on folinic acid or, or leucovorin um, made a substantial increase in verbal communication um, over 12 weeks. Um, and in this study, um, compared to the previous study, we had all comers, those that were 
positive and those that were negative um, for the folate autoantibody. So we were able to actually ask whether the antibody made a difference. And we found that, um, that yes, actually, that it was a significant uh, predictor of response um, and that uh, children with, um, <clears throat> uh, with the antibody um, their um, response rate uh, and, um, was, uh, was uh, really significantly better than those that didn't have the antibody uh, with a number needed to treat of 1.8, which is a pretty outstanding number for, um, uh, for clinical trials. Um, and uh, so interestingly, um, um, Dr. Quatros has developed a rat model, um, a prenatal rat model, of the folate autoantibody to see if it affects uh, um, the fetus, and he has actually shown that uh, that um, that uh, rats that uh, that pregnant rats that are exposed to the uh, folate autoantibody, the uh, pups come out with um, uh, um, behaviors that um, are akin to what we see in autism, and then he's also shown that by either using uh, steroids or um, a folinic acid, um, giving that to the mothers um, when they uh, have the antibodies, it actually ameliorates those behaviors and rescues um, the rats. Uh, so um, so that really kind of the next stage of looking at how these antibodies and how folate may um, affect um, the kiddos before birth and how we can fix that. Um, <clears throat> we have actually three clinical trials that are funded um, from this uh, research, one by Autism Speaks, another by the Department of Defense, and another one by NIH. Um, and they're all pretty much 24-week studies, 12-week double-blind placebo control trials with 12-week um, open label. Um, and, and, and we're really going to span the age range with these trials from uh, two and a half years of age up to 14 years um, of age. And uh, the Autism Speaks uh, funded trial will actually be doing neuroimaging so we can look at the neural pathways that are changing because of the leucovorin treatment. Um, so mitochondrial disorders are another area that we're very um, interested in and we think is very important. Um, I like to make the uh, point that the mitochondria, if you look at um, the, uh, this is the metabolic metro map, um, there's uh, there's um, other maps of um, metabolic pathways, but whatever map you look at, the mitochondria is in the middle. So it's it's pretty important, and you know I like to say that it affects and is affected by all other uh, physiological pathways in the in the cell. So it's it's really um, one of those centers of the cell that um, is is very very um, important and important to stay healthy um, as we. Probably know that the mitochondria is in um, almost every cell of our body. Our cells have anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of mitochondria, depending on their energy need. Mitochondria um, and uh, mitochondrial disease really is uh, something that uh, we're just really learning about. Really, the first mitochondrial diseases were described in 1988. So, you know, it's about 30 years ago. And in medical terms, that's really, you know, very young. You know, medicine does move slow. Um, so we're really learning more and more about the, uh, the mitochondria. Um, back in 2010, we started to um, ask, well, what's the role of the mitochondria in autism? And of course, uh, our interest um, was driven by the fact that there was more and more studies being published about mitochondria. Um, and so, of course, the first thing um, you do if you're a scientist is you look at the literature. So myself and my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Rosignol, uh, did a, a systematic review and meta-analysis of the literature. And we found something very interesting. We found that uh, the literature supported the fact that mitochondrial disease, which is um, you know, a, a very particular um, category um, of diagnosis uh, could be found in about 5% of children with autism. And given that mitochondrial disease are rare diseases, you know, this is really a gigantic number. 
But the other thing uh, we found is that studies that have looked at biomarkers of mitochondrial dysfunction, that is blood-based biomarkers that tell you the mitochondria is not working correctly, uh, showed much higher rates of abnormality uh, than this 5%, somewhere around 30%. So it suggested that, uh, that while there are um, some children with autism that have mitochondrial disease, that, uh, that there's a larger amount that may have something else going on with the mitochondria that might not fall into this particular um, category of classic mitochondrial disease. Um, and others have, have looked at this, and I don't have time to go into all of the, the data and such. It's an interesting discussion, but you know, the um, 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 others have, have come up with this, uh, this diagram that shows that kind of autism, you know, um, there's some overlap with um, mitochondrial disease, which we categorize into possible, probable, or definite. Um, and then there seems to be this non-classic mitochondrial disease, or what we tend to call mitochondrial dysfunction, that may overlap with a greater number of children with autism, which we're still um, learning to define. One of the ways that uh, we want to look at this, of course, you know, we want to take this into a laboratory um, and look at this. We uh, use something called the Seahorse Analyzer, and this is kind of a, a revolutionary tool that allows us to look at mitochondrial function in living tissue. You know, previous to this, really, you'd have to isolate mitochondria and measure one sample at a time. It was very laborious, slow, um, and um, you couldn't really look at multiple samples. And really, the seahorse allowed us to look at multiple samples in living tissue um, and then and a 96-well plate. So you could put both controls and um, your cases um, on the same plate, and then you can manipulate um, the samples too to see how the mitochondria reacted. Um, so um, this uh, this um, analyzer gives us a number of different uh, measurements, including something called ATP-linked respiration, which tells you how much of the uh, the mitochondrial um, effort goes to making ATP, the energy molecule of the cell. How much goes to something called proton leak, which is a control valve um, when there's high levels of oxidative stress. It's kind of wasted energy. Um, and then it allows you to look at something called maximal respiratory capacity, which is the maximal ability of the, um, the, the mitochondria to make energy. Uh, and this gives you a parameter um, that, uh, that's called reserve capacity. And reserve capacity um, is important because that tells you how much reserve that the mitochondria has. We know that when that goes to zero, the mitochondria is in trouble. Um, and I'll kind of fast forward some of the details. What we found is that there was actually different subsets um, um, of mitochondrial function in the uh, cell lines. We were looking at lymphoblastoid cell lines. Um, and, and unlike what you see with mitochondrial dysfunction, Mitochondrial dysfunction, I'm sorry, with mitochondrial disease. In mitochondrial disease, you tend to see that the mitochondria isn't working very well. The respiratory rates are very low. Um, it's very dysfunctional. What we found is that there was a subset, about a third of the patients that we looked at, where the respiratory rates were extremely high. They were about twice that of normal. Um, and um, this is just another study that we published. I'm sorry that I don't have time to go into it more, but where we actually uh, wanted to look more at the genetic background. So we compared kids with autism um, uh, versus their uh, typically developing siblings um, and non-related controls. And we showed that this uh, phenotype of the mitochondria having these higher respiratory rates were specific to the child with autism was not shared by the typically developing sibling. And then we also showed that the variation of how extreme this abnormality was in the respiratory rates of the mitochondria was related to repetitive behavior um, uh, scores on the ADOS years before when these cells were um, actually taken from the children um, and an ADOS was done. Um, the, that their respiratory rates years later 
you know, when we tested them in the laboratory was actually related to their diagnostic ADOS scores. Um, we've looked at some of the molecular mechanisms and in this study, uh, we showed that something called UCP2, which controls oxidative stress um, at the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, the protein was upregulated. Um, there was more of it in these cells that, um, uh, the subset of cells that had abnormal mitochondrial function. And then in another study, we looked at gene expression. And what we found was uh, that some of the genes that you would expect to be upregulated um, in cells that are under physiological stress um, were not upregulated in uh, the, um, uh, these uh, um, samples uh, where the mitochondria was uh, functioning, or had these high respiratory rates, and that this could have been um, due to um, inhibition um, from the uh, um, uh, F6K1 a downstream pathway from mTOR, and then we were actually able to use rapamycin uh, to show low-dose rapamycin uh, to suggest that by inhibiting this pathway, we'd actually restored uh, respiratory rates um, in those uh, cells back down to normal. Um, some of the genes that were uh, found to be um, uh, uh, not, uh, not upregulated as they should control mitochondrial morphology. So the other thing we're doing is uh, we're looking in fibroblasts um, using confocal microscopy uh, to look at mitochondrial morphology. And indeed, in our preliminary data, we found that uh, there is uh, variation in mitochondrial morphology in um, these uh, fibroblasts from children with autism that seem to correlate with some of the respiratory abnormalities um, that is that uh, some of them, we see a variation from um, them um, being very clustered, the mitochondria being very clustered and closer to the nucleus, which you can see on the left, or more distributed throughout the cell and more stringy, uh, which you see on the right. Um, so we've also have a, a cohort of uh, patients where we've looked at um, the, uh, the uh, mitochondrial function in their immune cells. Um, from fresh immune cells in probably about uh, 200 kids with autism to see if this effect is not just in these uh, cell lines, but actually in, uh, in fresh tissue uh, from children with autism. And indeed, we found that uh, these high respiratory rates, um, uh, um, and here we show reserve capacity with the, the red um, triangles, was high in about a third of uh, the kiddos that we tested um, uh, where we have a fresh um, 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 <clears throat> um, uh, PBMCs, uh, peripheral blood monocytes. And we also took uh, cells from kiddos with mitochondrial disease, which you can see on the panel on the right, and showed that actually this uh, profile of abnormalities and respiratory rates are distinct from classically defined mitochondrial disease. So this does seem to be a separate a type of mitochondrial dysfunction that's distinct from mitochondrial disease. Um, in a, a recent paper uh, with Dr. Uh, Zimmerman um, from UMass, um, we uh, found that uh, this profile seemed to be uh, connected with neurodevelopmental regression um, uh, in kiddos. And then um, in two recent papers, which are really interesting, what we did is we looked at prenatal environmental influences, specifically air pollution um, and um, both nutritional and toxic metals that the baby was exposed to as measured in deciduous teeth. Um, and we correlated this with their mitochondrial dysfunction in childhood. So we asked the question whether prenatal exposures um, could actually program the mitochondria and its respiratory rates later on in life. Um, and we divided the groups into those with neurodevelopmental regression and those without neurodevelopmental regression, which includes early onset, and those with developmental plateau. And what we found was uh, pretty outstanding was that, uh, that, that yes, mitochondrial function in childhood is uh, related to uh, these exposures 
Um, and for air pollution, um, this was different. There was opposite um, um, effects, uh, but strong effects in um, those with and without neurodevelopmental regression, with the effect being stronger in those with neurodevelopmental um, regression. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go through all the data in detail. Um, and then we asked, we asked, well, the effect of um, the uh, prenatal air pollution on neurodevelopment, uh, since the prenatal air pollution uh, exposure could modulate mitochondrial function, does that account for some of the variation in neurodevelopment and behavior? And the answer is yes, that uh, it seems that about 25% um, of the effect of prenatal exposure to air pollution is accounted for by its effect on mitochondrial function. Um, um, and this is a, a simple um, uh, analysis here. We use structural equation models to actually pull out some more of the metabolic parameters um, and found that, uh, for example, uh, for uh, neurodevelopment, it seemed that, um, that the effect of prenatal air pollution as measured by uh, PM25 exposure accounted for about a third of um, neurodevelopment, um, that mitochondria function um, uh, accounted for about a third, and that uh, redox status, redox abnormalities, accounted for about um, a third or a little bit less than a third. Um, and what we find exciting about this is the fact that, um, it, that both mitochondrial function and redox abnormalities are things that you may be able to fix. Um, with their, with um, some simple, safe therapies. And so you may be able to affect neurodevelopment. Um, the other interesting thing that we found is that um, the effect on behavior as measured by the ABC and the SRS was really only affected by, uh, by air pollution in our model. Um, and that uh, the effect of these physiological factors, mitochondrial function and redox metabolism, affected behavior through its effect on neurodevelopment. Um, and then we uh, did some, some very interesting studies, which were really a follow-up of, um, or helped define some of the other um, studies that Dr. Uh, Arona from um, uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine has really done um, on deciduous teeth, actually looking at baby teeth to measure uh, the exposures prenatally, what the actual child was exposed to. And some of the studies that he found is that, uh, that a prenatally manganese and zinc um, levels differentiated uh, children with autism and, uh, and those that were typically developing. And in another study, he found out that zinc copper um, ratios or um, uh, metabolic cycles um, actually differentiated kids with autism and typical uh, development. What we did is we looked at a number of different uh, metals that he could measure, including nutritional metals, um, uh, magnesium, manganese, copper, zinc, uh, which are important for physiology, and other toxic metals, um, uh, lead, nickel, chromium, stromium, tin, and barium. And what we found is that, um, that when we looked at mitochondrial function, that uh, both, both zinc and manganese were, um, uh, were found, prenatal levels of zinc and manganese were related to long-term mitochondrial function, and that, um, and that, zinc, uh, that copper zinc ratios um, were related to language um, in childhood. So this is all um, prenatal levels as measured by deciduous teeth. Um, and you ask, what do these all have in common? Um, and we know that, uh, that copper, zinc, manganese are all very important for something called superoxide dismutase in the cell, which is important for controlling um, oxidative stress um, and redox uh, metabolism. And so this may be something that's very important prenatally to allow cells not to be damaged and to develop unhealthy. Um, uh, so I won't go into this, but here's just a nice um, diagram uh, that, uh, that highlights some of the factors that have been 
associated with um, uh, with um, with autism um, prenatally, um, and um, that seem to also affect the mitochondria. So um, you know we're very excited about mitochondrial function, um, and um, we have right now a a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study where we're actually looking at a treatment that uh, um, to see if it will actually uh, normalize mitochondrial function and also normalize behavior um, and development. So we can um, try to see if this is a, a therapy that may help children um, with autism and also fix some of the physiological um, abnormalities. Um, the last thing I'll talk about quickly, I know I'm running out of time, is really the very exciting work on the microbiome. Um, we've all heard about the microbiome, our gut microbiome, and, um, and um, how abnormalities may be involved in diseases. We know that there's a, a really nice um, model, um, uh, Paul Patterson and Sarkis um, Rosmanian have developed, um, that, uh, that suggests the microbiome is very important. Um, in the development of autism. And then there's really the, the groundbreaking work by Jim Adams um, at ASU right down the road from us um, that, uh, that has uh, shown that microbiome transplants, um, um, formerly known as fecal transplants, um, may improve autism symptoms and normalize the microbiome. Um, and this is the study that they published that was open label and we're currently doing the double-blind placebo control study in something called microbial transfer therapy, which now has been formulated into a pill form. So you can take it just like a, a medication um, and, um, and manipulate the microbiome and hopefully normalize it and improve um, behavior and uh, symptoms. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll uh, take any questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fry. Um, I have a couple questions from our attendees. So um, the first one is, are there other exposures or comorbidities you expect to be included in future studies looking at mitochondrial abnormalities? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we, we, we want to take a, a wide look at, at many different um, um, exposures, um, you know, um, both you know, um, so um, of course the one. You know, one of the things that um, you know I think is, is so important to remember is that uh, we talk about the environment um, and how it forms our body, and the most important environment it, I think really is those nine months in um, you know during gestation. And so um, we really want to take a very you know close look at all the factors. Um, including during gestation, uh, both positive and negative. That is, you know, nutritional, um, uh, other disease uh, uh, that the, the the mother might have, other physiological abnormalities uh, that the uh, that the mother might have, other types of exposures. So the deciduous teeth is really very powerful. Uh, we can look at these metals, which is important, but we can also look at many different organic compounds that the actual baby was exposed to. So not you know not by medical history, but or, or you know by uh, by the mom remembering what happened, we can actually measure what the child was exposed to um, in utero. Um, and we think that of course the folate autoantibody and folate metabolism metabolism is uh, is very important. And then of course there's other things like psychological stress and such that are other factors that are very important too. Uh, to look at too. So, you know, there's, a, you know, it's so multidimensional and there's so many factors, you know, um, it's, a, a, and it's important because so many of them we think can uh, affect, you know, how the fetus uh, grows and how the child develops um, and, um, and some of these physiological pathways. Thank you. Um, the next question is going back to the beginning of your presentation. It says, um, great presentation, thank you. Any tips for recruiting PCPs for autism-related training? So um, one of the things that we're trying to do, it's a great question because, you know, it's one of these things where uh, people have a lot of enthusiasm, you know, and then as kind of the work, you know, your regular work day, you know, goes, you know, the practicalities of things um, 
you know, um, uh, you know, start to get in the way. So um, we've tried to uh, do it in a number of different ways. Of course, making it easy, putting the webinars, recording them so that um, if if a PCP can't make a, a session, they they can uh, do it kind of offline. Um, but um, um, and then the other thing is also trying to um, include billing so they know how they can get reimbursed. But one of the other things I think that we're really trying to do is that um, in the program is get a lot of the pediatricians that have gone through the program and have been successful and promote them as the teachers. Um, and uh, because, you know, it's great for all specialists to kind of tell people what, you know, that they should be doing. But I think that if you can get people that have been done it um, and been an example to other primary care doctors have done it successfully and can try and mentor them, and that's one of the reasons we're going to try and use mentors this year, you may be somewhat more successful, but it is quite tough. Thank you. Um, we probably have time for one last question, um, which is, what outcomes do you suspect will be prioritized in future studies, including Luke Coburn? Excuse me, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's great, you know, and, and it's it's one of these things, it, it's, it's somewhat, um, it, um, it, it's, um, it, you know, designing clinical trials is tough um, because, there's lots of things we'd like to look at, right? But uh, we don't have the, uh, the measures to do so. And this is especially important uh, for what, you know, our next step is. Of course, I think that some of our success was the fact that we picked language to look at and not because it was language, but because we had the tools to measure it. And um, the uh, study um, that's funded by Autism Speaks, we're trying to take the next step and look at measures of, of uh, social communication um, to see if um, if we can show that those will be improved because those are really more core to autism and we really like to do that but of course we're we're up against the the problem that we we don't have really advanced tools or we, you know tools that have been developed um, to uh, to to measure that but that's kind of our our next goal. <laughs> Great. Well, I just want to say thank you very much again, Dr. Fry, for this wonderful presentation and for answering our questions on behalf of the audience and our network. Thank you. Um, and a reminder to everyone that um, you should get an email following this presentation um, with a link to the recording, and it'll be on our network YouTube channel. So feel free to share it with um, folks who may not have been able to make it today. Um, and thanks again. Thank you.